Um, that will, now we'll at least grab this data. Let's see, Christy, Jen, let's see who else is here, Abigail. So, why, there we go. Hi, Jen. Hi. Okay, so it's working the way it's supposed to now, at least as people sound, make sounds, they come into, into focus, so that's good. Um, yeah, we, we, are, we are having trouble. So, um, Anna, if you're still on the line, do you see the three little button more option to go live to Facebook with this option? Yeah, I figured. All righty. Well, I made my announcement. I'm crying on the inside, but here we all are. Um, let's see. Thank you. Um, so I see Jen. Um, somebody else make a noise so we can see all of you. Say hi. hi. I'm there we go. Hi, Tanya. Hi, sweetheart. You look beautiful. Hi, hey. Hey. Hi, Priscilla. Hi. Hey, this is Priscilla. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining. Thanks Gail's for having here, me. But my speaker says my page is Alora. <laughs> hi, I Gail. Know. I don't know what that means, but hi, how are you? That's my real name. Hi, Erin. Oh my gosh, it's so good hi. to see your face. Hi, sweetheart. Hi. Good to see you. You look beautiful. Thank you. Great wow. Too. You guys, this is a power-packed room right here. I'm like so <laughs> excited to have this conversation with you all. Wow. Well, um, let's, uh, without too much uh, further ado, um, get this party started. Um, anyone here that hasn't said hi yet? I'm here. Can you see me on here? I can't. There we go. Christy, hi. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Good. So Priscilla, because you have a little person around you, I'm going to have you mute yourself most of the time. Okay. That works. I'll mute and hopefully she falls asleep or else I'm going to hand her off to daddy. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly if, if I call your name, unmute, no matter what the background noise, just tell us hi, but otherwise just keep it mute. Otherwise you're going to be on the screen the whole time because it pulls Yeah, off. no, we don't want that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. Well, so um, <clears throat> I am so, so, so honored to, um, to get to visit with you all and, um, and welcome you uh, to this really kind of epic conversation. Um, so uh, thank you. Thank you all uh, for agreeing to participate um, and helping families and moms and midwives. Um, these are really strange times we live in, and one of the most amazing things is that um, we are having conversations and re-examining beliefs and ideas that we never would have. So that part is quite exceptional in my perspective. Um, so during this global pandemic, um, this topic is potentially very divisive, and that's why I've asked each of you um, experts in birth, midwifery, and choosing to birth unassisted. Um, I've asked each of you to participate. And hi to those just joining. Good to see you. You look beautiful. Welcome. Hi. Um, so the point of this presentation is not to convince anything of anything, anyone of anything, positive or negative. The point is to convey fact based, current, thorough, and unbiased information so that people may make their own informed choices. Um, and you guys know this, um, and in, in a time when it's not quite so crazy, um, of course we all make our own choices. Um, but in this day and age, it feels like um, we are, we're being forced, we're being asked to do things that um, really maybe aren't in everyone's best interest. So um, <clears throat> I, my name is Augustine Coldbrook. Uh, I'm a midwife and a mentor and a muse. Uh, I'm also a mama and a grandma. Uh, I have had um, all of my children at home. A lot of people uh, know that. But what a lot of people don't know is I had all of my children by myself. And uh, I've invited an incredible group of people to join us today. Uh, we're all in a collective reality that's really unprecedented. 
people are suddenly reevaluating and reimagining beliefs and truths that they never really or rarely thought about. And perhaps the group most forced to come to terms with our new reality and the repercussions are pregnant people and their families. Everything is different now for pregnant people, and in an effort to keep some things normal, some pregnant people are considering or planning to birth medically unassisted. I've gathered this amazing group of my colleagues to discuss this choice, and these midwives with me today have all themselves also chosen to birth unassisted. None of us came to this choice lightly, I think, and most of us um, thought long and hard, researched long and hard about this, and some of us don't even feel like it was a good decision after the fact. But we are the right people to advise families on this choice because we sit at the juncture between personal empowerment and risk assessment. We truly see both sides. This topic is fraught with opinions and fear, and no doubt I and or my colleagues will be criticized by some of our colleagues for even entertaining this idea or sharing it. But I have a conviction that the person with the uterus is the sovereign decision maker and that the person with the uterus gets to decide why and how and when and where and with whom to use their uterus and any other attached sexual body parts, reproductive organs. I also believe that to make informed decisions, you need unbiased, thorough, fact-based information. So today's presentation is not a conversation on why people choose to birth outside the system. That question has actually been answered very succinctly by the esteemed midwifery professor in Australia, Hannah Dolan, in her new book that was published just in November called Birthing Outside the System, The Canary in the Coal Mine. This presentation, in, in fact, aims to be a resource for families hesitant about the unknown and seeking for a tenable path forward. We who have made this choice before and have extensive education and experience in managing birth complications will discuss how this choice is made. The type of birth that we discuss today is medically unassisted, sometimes called UC, free birth, do-it-yourself birth, DIY. The birthing person is, is generally at home with any non-medical emotional support people that they want. However, that's not always the case. We midwives have all heard stories of unassisted hospital births, right? And all of us have heard stories of car birth and supermarket birth, and even in the case of Hurricane Katrina, stranded on the roof of a house and then climbing a tree, unassisted birth. So the flat denial by most medical mouthpieces that unassisted birth is a, not a valid choice misses the point, especially in these dystopian times. The simple truth is that unassisted birth happens all over the globe, in all locations, throughout all of human history. So we're going to talk about it and not dismiss it. Right now, with the global pandemic and people sheltering in place and hospitals readying to be at full capacity, pregnant families more than ever are considering staying home when they're in labor for a multitude of reasons, many of them quite valid, like not exposing them or their, their babies to the coronavirus, fear of not getting enough care as a result of diminishing resources, fear of getting whisked through an assembly line of care involving interventions like C-sections, and now avoiding separation from their baby and potentially birthing entirely alone in some hospitals because of the new policies aimed at reducing the spread of the virus. These are very real and very shockingly grave concerns. And we cannot possibly hope to unpack or unravel them in this broadcast, but what we can do, what we can do is help to understand how people make these decisions, how people prepare to birth unassisted, and how people actually do give birth. The why is up to each individual person, but suffice it to say, I understand the why. And I want to say, I deeply, with my mama and midwife heart, understand. As far as I can tell from lurking in mama chat boards and discussing the increased call to my midwifery siblings around the globe and the general social media outcry, pregnant people fall into one of three camps. And sometimes they switch between them. None of them are blind faith, which is perhaps 
another significant benefit of this whole crisis, but that's a conversation for a different broadcast. They either, number one, think, I am afraid. I can't make sense of how fast the world is changing and I'm really terrified of the unknown. Or two, I'm terrified of the unknown, so I'm gonna make plans I can control. Or number three, good. I always wanted to live as a hermit, homesteader, live in the bush, Timbuktu, the jungle. Swiss Family Robinson was my favorite movie and I've been prepping for this my whole life. For those of you in that camp, I, I get you. Um, preparing to birth really brings everything into focus. The biological imperative that is to reproduce and the hormonal rush of pregnancy create a kind of laser focus on the matter. And it really shines what matters and what doesn't. doesn't. Wherever you are, we feel the stress parents are under right now. And for the record, I want to say that choosing to birth unassisted at any time, but especially now, does not reduce your stress. It just trades now stress for then stress. So today we're gonna to talk to our panel of experts um, who themselves have made this choice to better understand the how. So um, I, want to, um, I want to ask, um, some of you have made the decision to birth unassisted before there you were midwife. Um, and so just, I can see your screens. If you would just kind of raise your hand if that's one of the, if that's you. Yeah, so let's start with Christy. Christy, if you'll unmute yourself. Um, Hello, and, I'm and um, Christy, you made the choice to birth unassisted before you were a midwife. Can I ask you just kind of succinctly, we're gonna go rapid fire around people. What were you most afraid of at that time? Um, I was most concerned with postpartum and hemorrhaging. Um, being a mom in the past, I had had three babies up until the point I did my unassisted. And I was always tuned out during that time period and focusing uh -huh. on my baby. So it was nothing that I was really even aware of because the midwife had always taken care of that. And so it was really un unfamiliar territory to me. So I had spent a lot of time during my pregnancy looking at postpartum possible complications and informing myself about those. Awesome. Awesome. Um, we're going to go to Gail. Gail is in, oh, oh, wait, Christy, where are you? What, what state are you in? I'm currently in Pennsylvania. I was in You're Colorado in when I did my unassisted. Got it. Okay, thanks. Um, Gail's in New York, um, and um, she has um, some feelings. Um, tell us, Gail, will you tell us what were you most afraid of? And you'll have to unmute yourself to talk. I was actually most afraid of unnecessary people being interjected into my birthing experience. Uh -huh. Yeah, that is totally a reality. You can't, you can't be the watch guard and the laboring mom. You can't mm -hmm. patrol your space and let go. Yeah, that's so true. Okay. Um, Aaron, can I call on you? I can't remember exactly the sequence. Sure. For you but I think you had babies back in the day yeah I had I had one um, first born planned home birth transport and then my second was um, an unassisted birth and what were you most afraid of during that time I wasn't afraid of anything I just knew that that's what I wanted to do and um, I mean you know to be honest I wasn't I wasn't even 100% committed to having an unassisted birth I you know if plans changed and I felt like I my needs changed when I went into labor I was open to calling <clears throat> someone but I just it really wasn't a decision it was just a feeling of what I knew would happen and and did happen mm -hmm. so <laughs> <laughs> I well I love it I love your honesty there it's it's so great um Casey can I call on you I um Casey and uh Aaron is in uh Idaho I think right right yeah. now okay and uh Casey is in Utah Casey can we uh hear from you what what were you afraid of I was only afraid of having another c-section 
Uh Um, Yeah, I didn't want to go back to that system and have a C-section and another NICU stay. And yeah, like I wasn't scared of birthing at home. I was scared of going to the hospital. Yeah. And there are many that feel that way even more now. Um, and, and yeah, truly. Um, I would love to go um, over Sarah Tuck. Is Sarah on the line? I haven't seen her yet. I'm here. Oh, good. Hi. You're here. Hi. Sarah is in Washington now. Um, yeah. Tell us, when you were planning your unassisted birth, what fears came up for you? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Mostly that um, when I was born, my mom was separated from me for a really long time. And so viscerally, the thought of being in a hospital and being separated from my baby, I couldn't, there wasn't anyone that was going to do that to me. And in a really visceral way, like this trauma that had been, that came from my own birth. And so that was my biggest reason, I think, for having an unassisted birth. And because I, there wasn't anyone that I felt like could support support me and serve me at that time but I just didn't I don't think I could handle it if anyone took my baby away from me yeah 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 that's that is even more salient now so I yeah that is a real yeah. real worry yeah all righty so um for those of you um that that planned your unassisted birth before you were a practicing midwife um, and had some kind of worries. What were your resources? What did you go to that helped you make this choice or or figure it out? Anyone want to? Uh, I can that? speak to that. Yeah, yeah. go. Um, I had had my first baby in the hospital, and so that really drove a lot of my decision to seek um, an alternate um, path and. So I spent about six years really just kind of like um, learning everything that I could possibly learn. And um, so my education was really a a very long process to get to that point. And even with that education, um, I still, like someone else mentioned, didn't, didn't know that that was going to be our path until it was actually our path. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have something they want to land? What resources, books or videos or people or inspiration or like what helped you? The first time that I considered it was about a year before the birth. Um, I knew that a move might be coming and I had done some research and there weren't a lot of midwives um, in the prairie area where I was going to. Um, It would have been about 45 minutes to a hospital. So I had talked with the woman who was my midwife in the area where I was moving from and she gave me hearts and hands as a recommendation. Um, I did some online searching Mm -hmm. and it was during the time period where Rixa Freeze was also planning her unassisted birth. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was following her blog very closely. Um, her and I were both pregnant at the same time. So she was a wealth of knowledge at that time period. There were also some other unassisted sources that I was following at that time as well. Will you list them? I think people are curious. Um, like blogs or something? I honestly can't remember all of the okay. ones that were available at that point. Um, Rixa was definitely the foremost in my mind, but there uh-huh. were also like baby center boards and, mm-hmm. you know, not having been a midwife at that time, I found what was available and just absorbed mm-hmm. as much information as I could. Um, mm-hmm. Having that, you know, quest for information and just being able to glean as much information as possible. Um, As midwives, we know that it all just becomes an obsession to learn as much as we possibly can. And that was really the mind frame that I was in while I was preparing for that unassisted. Awesome. Thank you for that. Anyone else have some specific resources they want to share? Well, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So I made a list, so I'll just read through it if you want. Back yeah, then, that'd be great. With, Thanks. Um, uh, Ina Mays, midwifery was a starting point, and then Laura Shanley, um, her book and her website was extensive, and there was also a 
Your sound is really off and we can't quite hear you. Can you adjust your sound? How would I do that? There, you're closer now. Yeah, Go ahead I'm and see. closer. Okay. So through um, Seaver, the big U Seaver, Lori Morgan and Laura Stanley, Seaver video that went around the new nativity um, newsletter, Mango Mama website, Seed Kits, Marilyn Morin. Um, Marilyn Moran, uh, yeah. 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 Um, I read uh, Judy Rawls online unhindered birth class, Ronnie Felton, uh, Gentle Birth Archive. Layla McCracken's really big birth love website was amazing in the day where I learned about Michelle O'Donnell and Sarah Buckley and their approach to the physiology of birth and how the hormones of birth come. Um, Brantley degrees, childbirth without fear, childbirth was around, and Gloria LeMay was an amazing resource. Self available to benefit to birthers everywhere. Yeah, your, your sound is so bad. See if you can find some headphones to plug in or something. Uh, you can really tell what years we had unassisted births based on the resources. <laughs> you and I had babies at the same time frame, I think. <laughs> yeah, at the turn of the millennia. Yeah, right. Jen is um, in, in Canada, actually. Um, and um, I think there's a movement there to have unassisted birth as well, um, kind of everywhere. Um, Hannah Dolan's book, Birthing Outside the System, The Canary in the Coal Mine, is so fantastic because she really explored the why. Why women before, like pre-pandemic, were wanting to get out of the system. Um, and now, of course, with the new regulations, um, people are even more terrified of it. Um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, Marilyn Moran is, has been a perennial resource. I think her books were published in the 40s or something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I want to add one more to the list. Um, do you, did you ever grab Lynn Griesmer's book, Unassisted yeah. Home Birth? Yep. Yeah, Lynn's a friend of mine, um, mm -hmm. and she published the same right around the time I had a mm -hmm. baby there. And we lived in the same town, so we used to have lunch together. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a beautiful book. Um, and then Laura Shanley's Unassisted Childbirth that you said was a really good resource for years and years. Anyone else want to weigh in on this before we move on? Yeah, I had a couple of um, okay. recommendations. So I had a friend of mine when I became pregnant who shared some of her experience having an unassisted birth with me. And that led me to Sarah Buckley's work uh, uh -huh. and about undisturbed birth and to Laura yeah. Shanley and also yeah. into to indie birth. I don't know. I haven't heard yeah. that mentioned before, yeah. but I that was the first time that I saw a birth community of women that and you know people coming together birthing autonomously and I hadn't really seen that before because it wasn't yeah. as much on my radar and that's part of yeah. what inspired me to become to become a midwife but I use that indie birth resource and um and Sarah Buckley I just would read her book over and over and over again until that's beautiful when I went through fears that ha that came up for me um, that's beautiful. and that's from there, I was able to find stories like online. You know, I gave birth six, almost six years ago. And so it's, I had the opportunity to use Facebook and have, read stories on Facebook. Yeah, well. yeah. The, the, the connectivity of technology now, except for yeah. my inability to connect with this no. podcast. But sometimes technology really is a blessing. It's it so is fun. such a blessing. <laughs> yeah, it's such a blessing. And yet I, um, I'm, I'm not the... Not the best. Okay. Well, so um, some of you chose to give birth unassisted after you were already a midwife. And I'd love to shift to that now if we could, um, because it's kind of a different part of your brain that chooses unassisted birth when you understand more of the risk. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm pretty sure that's you, Tanya. Would you weigh in? Tanya's in California. Hi. Uh, yeah, you know, I had my first 25 years ago in a hospital system and was given the wrong medication and lost my eyesight. And so then I went on to have home birth midwives with or home births with midwives, mm -hmm. two of them. And then I think that my coming to unassisted birth was kind of an evolution of who I was as a midwife, you know, and my trust in birth. So I really, 
You know, I didn't want anyone to, I really had this desire to catch my own baby, you know, really catch my own baby and know that nobody else was going to put their hands there. Mm -hmm. um, and just to really own, you know, my personal autonomy and my space. So that's why I chose it. Awesome. Were you, were you afraid? Was there like a risk factor or a complication or a previous birth complication you'd just been at that was playing in your head? Like, tell us about yeah. using your midwife brain in this process. Yeah. So I was actually afraid of bleeding. Um, I had led some with my second baby, Nanita Pitocin. Um, and I think that I knew because I've seen women hemorrhage that if I were to start bleeding profusely, I wouldn't be in control of my, you know, my right mindset enough to go and get the Pitocin and give myself a shot and actually take care of myself. Uh, so that was definitely one of my biggest fears. Yeah. Yeah. And shoulder dystocia. <laughs> and so, shoulder dystocia. I, yeah. It's hard to be your own midwife. And I think yeah. this is, this is the real reality that, that we face. Yeah, I had um, had babies with sticky shoulders, and so I was really counting on that lunge to help me out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it did. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, let's see. Who else wants to weigh in on this? Who made the choice after they had a baby? I already I mean, answered, they... but, yeah. but, um, but I, I was a midwife but when, I, when yeah. I had my unassisted birth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and... But... I, I was, you know, I wasn't really um, real afraid of anything, but I, I was, you know, I, I, hemorrhage was definitely on my radar and of all of yeah. the things, you know, I think that that was um, probably what I was most, I took the most concerted effort to address that potential complication mm -hmm. um, in the sense that I... <laughs> I had a little, you know, I, I had my herbs and my stash of meds and I had written down with my partner, you know, he had this special notebook and I had him take some notes of, you know, things, um, you know, assuming that if I were really in a state of, of, of hemorrhage or going into shock, I'm not going to be managing my own, you know, meds, right? Mm -hmm. um, so he had all of that information in a little notebook and it was kind of funny and, and maddening at the actual time of the birth because of course it went off without a hitch. And I look up and there, my partner's like flipping through the birth, like, like what, what, like what, what do I do now? You know, do like, where are we in the notebook? And I'm like, just fuck the notebook. <laughs> the baby's here and, you know, come be with me. And it was, I, I oh, still have to so get great. him about it. You know, like we argue about it all the time. Like, Remember well, when you were such, reading the notebook? <laughs> well, that, I mean, Erin, you are, you are really hitting on one of the worries that exists, which is like, what happens when we are asking dads or doulas to be paramedical mm -hmm. professionals? Mm -hmm. Like right. how, how does it, how do we really relax and depend on them? And how do they actually step up and what happens in that whole process? So you really just, you, you, gave us a great visual for that whole, whole worry there. Um, and we're going to try to answer some of these soon. Um, Christine's on the line. I see Christine. Hi, my friend. Have you slept Hi. at all? <laughs> Not yet, but when, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure because I'm not using, um, I'm not using headphones and a mic because I did a Zoom earlier uh, with MSF and it wasn't working. I had to do it this way. So I'm doing okay. this this way. I hope it's working. Yeah, it's working okay. So yeah, after, um, after I'm done with you guys, I'm going to go to bed. Christine is in Bolivia working with Doctors Without Borders and she's just come off a 48 hour shift. Um, so I'm just sending you all the love because you are such a hardworking dynamo. Um, do you want to answer this? When you were preparing for your unassisted birth, what were you afraid of? I wasn't afraid of anything. Um, yeah, I, was, I, I had been a midwife for 11 years. That's what I wanted to do. Um, yeah. I was alone, actually. I didn't have an unassisted birth. I, uh -huh. I was alone uh -huh. in my house for 30 yeah. hours yeah. before you were born. So it was... Uh, it was the best experience of my life. 
I mean, I don't think there's anything that will ever top that as experiences. And I've done a lot of really cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, you so, have. <laughs> but really, he's my only um, son, and I'm 20. So anyway, yeah, it was, uh, no, it was a fantastic experience, regardless wow. of those 36 hours. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're actually going to talk about that now. We're going to talk about um, thinking back, what was your strongest feeling of birth? And so Christina's saying it was amazing. It was exceptional. Um, some of you have echoed that, that it like was life-changing and everything. But that's not always the feeling. Um, I can definitely say when I think back over specifically my second birth, and I had all babies unassisted, um, and I chose to have an unassisted birth because it was a better choice than the other choices available to me, not because I really wanted to be alone in the woods. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I had a second baby unassisted because by then you just kind of like, you're like, well, I'm, I don't need it. You know, I get it now, you know? Um, and my second birth was, was, I would say when I think back on it, I think the word torture describes it best. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I have, I had, I mean, I've worked through a lot, but I had real trauma after that birth. And so I always like to talk to people and say, um, just remember that, that, um, trauma is not necessarily what quote unquote they do to you. Mm -hmm. Trauma is oftentimes, um, in my experience, birth trauma comes from, um, un- unmet expectations. So I had an expectation, much like has been expressed here by some people, that it would be like, you know, glowy and flowy and beautiful and magical and et cetera, et cetera. And instead, I, it was not. <laughs> um, if you have some background noise, go ahead and mute yourself. That way um, you won't be on the camera. Um, and so that, um, that experience was really shocking to me. And I actually have memories of being in labor um, wanting very much to die. And that is um, a fairly normal experience for most natural labor for like some split second. Basically, every mama hits a wall and is like, oh, I can't do this anymore. I really, I run off this train. Get me off this labor train. Um, but mine went on for about nine hours uh, like that. And um, I think looking back... I didn't go anywhere because I was so gone in it that I didn't have the brain stem ability to understand that I could go somewhere, if that makes sense. I mean, there's a, there's a physical part where, like, I definitely would have been given a cesarean um, for him. Um, and so there's, like, a physical after the fact where it's like, well, I'm really glad I didn't have a cesarean. <laughs> but... Um, I'm not sure that's the worst thing. Like, I think a cesarean is not the worst thing. I think intervention is not the worst thing. Um, and so I just wanted to just kind of circle us back. You know, I want to cover the whole spectrum of experience in choosing this. And um, I did go on and have my third unassisted as well. Um, and I learned a lot from my experience and it's definitely made me a better midwife and da, da 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 But I would just say that it's not always a positive experience. And a huge part of whether it's positive or negative has to do with number one, expectations. How do you, what do you expect this to be like? And um, number two would be actually the, the, the position of your baby impacting the course of your labor. So, um, with that said, I'd love to bring Carrie in. Carrie is a really um, esteemed, experienced midwife in Oregon. Did we just lose her? Where is she? Oh my gosh. There she is. Hi, Carrie. You have to unmute yourself. Right. Um, Carrie is a really ex esteemed, experienced midwife in Oregon. Um, and Carrie also chose to have an unassisted birth. Will you tell us about your feelings for it now? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm Carrie. Hi, everybody. It's really fun to be on this call. Um, practicing in Portland, Oregon. I'm a midwife at Andalus Water Birth Center. Um, <clears throat> 14 years ago, I chose to attempt an unassisted birth with my daughter. Um, I had already been a practicing midwife for about six years. <laughs> um, 
I had, I did not have, I was my second baby. I had my first baby um, in a school bus in somebody's lap <laughs> after 12 hours. Um, and my experience as a midwife taught me that the second one was just going to squirt right out. And I would um, have much the feeling that you guys have of, you know, being delighted and empowered and all of that. Um, I did not choose to burn an assisted for lack of options. I, all of my midwives were friends. I live in Portland where we have a very um, alive and vibrant midwifery community. And all those ladies are my friends. <laughs> um, thank goodness, because I, I ended up having to call them. Um, Anyway, so yeah, I, I ended up having an unsuccessful <laughs> unassisted birth, wherein I ended up calling people after about 24 hours, and then those people I called a student. Um, I refused a lot of care and then ended up transferring to the hospital after three days. Um, so I ended up having chorioamunitis and just one of those situations that we all have run into where, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> things should have gone the right way, but they didn't and ended up with a cesarean birth and a beautiful kid. And um, yeah. so just a really interesting and, and also such an enriching experience as a midwife, um, a very humbling yeah. experience as a midwife. <laughs> so just one of the one of the things is just the range of experiences that people have. Yeah. Um, you know, we've all been to that birth where things should have gone differently, and I just happen to be that person. And you know, when we're when we're the person giving birth, we're all in the same. You know, we're we're in a level playing field. Your mid midwifery knowledge will not save you. <laughs> you yeah. Know, nature still affects you in the same way. So. Yeah. Happens well. Th thank you so so much for. Yeah. Um, for your, your, you know, just your vulnerability and your honesty with us in this circle. And then, of course, with the broader audience that will listen. Um, I, I so cherish your experience um, because um, it's representative of, I think, a lot of people. Um, and I think it's, it's a part of birth choice outcome that doesn't get talked about very much. <clears throat> and um, so I want to just sort of hone in right now with the group and, and explore this reality that, that actually most of the time birth goes beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, birth works. We, we live in an overpopulated planet because it works so well. Mm -hmm. um, but, but for the individual, not, not the planet, for the individual, there are significant um, challenges, risks, and sometimes poor outcomes, which is, of course, the whole reason why helping professions like midwifery, nursing, and obstetrics were developed. Um, and I think pre-pandemic, the choice to birth outside the system was in large part a reaction to the over-medicalization and the overuse of technology and equipment and supplies that are meant to decrease complications. But as they become monetized and become overused, now they're actually causing complications. Like mm -hmm. we know that the maternal death rate exactly mirrors the maternal cesarean rate in the United States. Even though the cesarean is a life-saving procedure um, and that is definitely needed for a percentage of people, um, when it's overused, it actually causes complications. So pre-pandemic, lots of people chose to risk the experience of doing it alone um, because of, of potential overuse of intervention and or they have a real, you know, um, faith and belief in their bodies and their babies and, and that and have, you know, chosen that way because of that. But we're not really going to explore the why so much. What I want to really talk about is is that complications do happen. Um, bad outcomes do happen. Um, and in fact, um, there's some recent um, birth certificate data coming out of Oregon showing that actually it's, it's not, it's, it's babies are who suffer the most um, and that unassisted birth produces um, 
a lot more bad outcomes for babies. Um, so this is all to say, um, I want us to kind of switch gears and put our midwife caps on for a minute and really, really hone our focus. We are talking to a nation of pregnant people who are facing the option or the, the reality of having a hospital system less available or not available, mm -hmm. or a hospital system that has protocols that make them totally undesirable for their birth experience. Um, let's talk about complications. Um, I think most of the complications people fear are actually very, very unlikely to happen, and they're very low, low likelihood. But there are some that actually are fairly high likelihood. And I really want to talk that through with people, um, with this, with the circle. Um, about 30% of women tear when they give birth. Um, about 5% um, of women, even with no risk factors, hemorrhage when they give birth. About 2% of women experience shoulder dystocia. These are these are real. They're not minuscule risks. They're real risk. Every one of us have dealt with these complications. Um, so I want to talk through, um, first of all, um, a really conscious risk assessment of yourself. Like if you were, if you were the birthing mom preparing to give birth um, right now in this day and age, um, and you were considering doing it alone because of lack of resources or because the resources are not what you like, what risk factors would you be really reminding women about? What do you want the birthing population to really be thinking about right now? Um, and I, I know that this is potentially leading conversation, and I know some of you, um, I mean, I, so let me, let, me, let me preface this by doing the flip side as well. I, I worship Sarah Buckley, um, everything that she's written about the hormonal process of labor and delivery, about how strangers interfering with that process, like in all mammals, changes the process. Um, I absolutely believe in the sphincter law as outlined by Ina May Gaskin, that actually fear and anxiety do diminish the, the effectiveness of the labor process and can actually slow and, dis, and disorder the process. So it, it's a tricky question because it's both sides, right? So actually, you know, this is why I rarely speak publicly about this because I, I don't sound very eloquent um, because my two parts of my brain war with each other because I, I really, I do believe both sides. I do believe that, that birth has inherent risk and that providers decrease that risk. Um, as a population. But then I also have a personal feeling of what it's like to birth unhindered. And that is um, a very, very powerful visceral feeling. And so I just want to open it up to the rest of you. If you have comments or, or commentary or suggestions on this topic, take it away. I know. I talked myself into a corner, didn't I? <laughs> I well, let's see. You. I can start. Yeah, go for it. Um, I agree with you that it is actually a really good thing to have a perspective from both sides and be willing to look that birth is normal, natural, physiological, and happens unhindered most of the time. But it's really important to be aware of what the complications are and to be, you know, privy to that information and seek help should the time come that that's necessary. Um, from a personal perspective, I labored on and off for three days. Um, contractions would start and stop and start and stop. And part of it was that I was not surrendering to that birth process and I wasn't fully trusting enough to just allow myself to be vulnerable enough to allow the birth to happen. But then it also ended up that my baby had a triple nuchal cord and the placenta came out with the baby and I was hemorrhaging. And so in hindsight, becoming a midwife after I had a baby unassisted, I realized that I probably was experiencing a placental abruption of some sorts because the baby was born with the placenta right behind her. Super mm -hmm. rare, doesn't happen often. I haven't seen something to that extent as a professional at a birth that I've attended, but realistically, 
what mom is going to stay home laboring on and off for three days unless she is determined that this is normal, this is natural, this is going to happen. I'm a living testimony that, you know, you can live through such an experience. Was it ideal? Probably not. Should I have yeah. seeked help at some point? Maybe, probably. Um, but, you know, hindsight it revealed to me through my training and as a midwife, you know, what probably happened. And I was a little bit um, naive that I was able to nurse myself back to health. Um, yeah. But listening to someone, listening to your own intuition that when you know something is dangerous or something is more risky is a good idea. Yeah. Thanks for that. Abigail, do you want to weigh in? We haven't heard from you yet. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I actually talk to a lot of families about unassisted birth. I'm a huge fan of unassisted birth. I had it unassisted with baby number eight uh, after I had started lightly practicing as a midwife. Um, so one of the biggest things that people ask me about is, well, what, what about all the things I need to know? You know, baby's heart tones and how do I know when I'm going to hemorrhage and what it looks like and all these things. You know, and I, and I give them resources. I talk to them, you know, technically about, you know, shoulder dystocias and hemorrhage and, and all that good stuff. But one of the really important things I like to instill in families intending to do this by themselves is that it's great to know, you know, normal heart tones. It's great to know what bleeding looks normal and what doesn't. But at the same time, untouched, unbothered birth has physiological safeguards. So I, I love to tell parents, like, it's great to know your baby's normal heart tones. It's great to know, you know, pay attention to what your bleeding looks like. But at the same time, we don't want to encourage partners to sit there with the Doppler, you know, yeah, watching yeah. so intently, being a disruption, yeah. because they're not, they're not a skilled midwife. A skilled midwife yeah. brings their intuition, their muscle memory, and all their skills. So it's a different kind of person sitting there as opposed to a partner who is sitting there going, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to know this thing, and I'm supposed to watch this thing. So I tell parents, you know, you got to meet yourself somewhere in the middle with this. It's good to know, you know, your baby's normals. You know, it's good to know what a lot of blood looks like. It's good to have a plan for this when those things happen. Um, I feel like the immediate postpartum is a, a thing that people don't, aren't totally aware of. That's why we, we see a lot of, you know, really bad outcomes with newborns. So I tell parents, trust your instincts as much as you're going to trust these little bits of things that you've learned, but don't expect to be able to sit there like a midwife when you may yeah. actually cause a disruption and that disrupts those physiological safeguards that we know are in place for all mammals when we don't do anything to a birth. And speaking about babies particularly, that's, I really, I really press on parents. Like if you're not sure, just go just transfer. Yeah. You know, if you're, if your baby doesn't look like they're transitioning, just go. We, we don't need to stay home. I, we got to this point and that's hard for people. You know, they got to that yeah. point, they're tired, they want to stay home, but that's why we see the bad outcomes because we wait. Yeah. We, we don't wait. So I, I encourage them to meet themselves in the middle, get all of the good evidence and the good research, get to know themselves and their baby really well and also pay attention to their own intuition. We don't, we don't need partners sitting there, like I said, charting, you know, yeah. and so when I had my birth, I had, a, I had a little kit sitting out. I talked to my husband very, you know, fluidly about, you know, this is this and this is what if, but it yeah. was never, I have an expectation of you to monitor my labor and my baby because he's, he's yeah. my midwife. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that's good advice. Um, I think Rebecca's on the line. Rebecca, can I call on you? Maybe not. Okay. Um, all righty. So um, let's move over. Carrie, can we circle back to you actually? Um, <clears throat> I have a question and it's, it's really personal and you can say, I don't want to answer if you don't want to, but what do you <laughs> wish? What'd you say? I love that stuff. Okay. Yeah, I thought you did. Uh, That's why I was picking on you a little bit. Um, what do you know now as a midwife? that you wished you'd known when you were birthing? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, I think the, the, the wisdom that I gained from that experience was that, um, that we're all equals. It doesn't matter if it's your, we're equals when we give birth, we're all on 
the same playing field and um you know i wouldn't change my my experience for anything like i i definitely think i needed that experience to help me be the critical thinking pragmatic midwife that i am today and <clears throat> i do a lot of births and i do i do a lot of care for a lot of different types of, of people um so i think that just the um being vigilant even if it's somebody's second baby and those always come, even if it's your eighth baby even if you know you've done this before i'm also a midwife um in my practice i'm a not in the middle midwife so most of my people give birth similar to an unassisted birth <laughs> um i don't disturb the birth space i definitely talk about unhindered birth and even unwatched i hide in the corner unless i need to be providing direct care um so um i think it gave me a little perspective about what that looks like for the average person and um how how valuable midwifery care is i think i definitely um took it for granted a little bit um the fact that i provided it the fact that i had received it um <clears throat> and the the experience really changed me as a midwife in that i you know uh, I, I, I actually kind of just don't know how to explain it. Just that the watchfulness, the fact that anything for anyone, you know, odds are everything's going to be great for everybody. Low risk people, mm -hmm. you know, odds are for low risk people, you are just going to have your baby and everything. Even if you have some unintended consequences, like you tear, it's odds are it's going to go back together, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. without sutures. It's going to heal. Odds are your bleeding is going to be fine. You know, rub your tummy. Let me show you, you know. Um, but there's always those outlying cases, and that can be anybody. Um, you know, you could have attempt this and have it go perfect your first time. You could attempt this and, you know, have it go sideways your eighth time. You don't, you know, yeah. there is no criteria of boxes to check because we're nature. We are nature. Yeah. Yeah. Nature goes sideways all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like right so, now. I mean, I'm all for honesty <laughs> birth still. I still yeah. am like, great, try, do it. It's probably going to be fine. Um, but we're nature and nature goes sideways all the time. Hello, we're in a pandemic. Um, and so sometimes unexpected things happen. And, you know, it's. it's all so I what's say. your biggest, what's your biggest, um, what's your biggest advice to people right now planning this? How do they know when it goes sideways? Well, I think that if you have midwives in your area, then you shouldn't plan it personally. I think that if you have access to people that can help you, that you should utilize that. And, you know, if you're planning this because you want, like me, I wanted to be in the wilderness, you know, I wanted to see what would happen if I made the ultimate sacrifice in the wilderness and did anything my birth asked me to and i did <laughs> do anything my birth asked me to i went to the hospital got an epidural that i would have put in place myself you know had the cesarean that i would have at that point done myself if given the opportunity um so <laughs> that's how so necessary it was it was so necessary <laughs> <laughs> the if midwife says cut me open yeah. yeah, I'll do yeah. it. Like, give me yeah. the thing. Like, clean it. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't, this is, don't actually give yourself cesareans. Okay, that's not her advice. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. I'm saying, just clarify. Alone if you don't have to be, if you, if yeah. you can be with somebody, mm -hmm. then do it. I, that's what I think. I mean, yeah. and, um, you know, and, and people may as definitely be in the situation where they're not able to in this, yeah. in this, you know pandemic and and they'll yeah. probably be fine you know yeah. um it usually does work out but what i realized that i neglected to give myself was the luxury of care wow the luxury of being loved on and having somebody else be the eyes <laughs> yeah. and letting me just be the vessel you know and i think that that as a midwife that's the gift that i give is yeah let me be the brain I'll do the appear work. You go back here. Yeah. 
you know, where yeah. you already know what to do. I don't have to tell you, but I'll do the anal analyzing, you know? So yeah. if you have somebody that um, can do that for you, I say, take them up on it. But that's just one lady's experience. And one lady's no, experience. I love it. Thank you for weighing in. I appreciate it so much. Your, your words of wisdom really ring true for me. Um, Gail, can I come to you? I know that you're kind of muted right now, but um, I want you to, to kind of answer the same question I just asked of um, what, what exact, like, how do I rephrase it? Um, how, how, can, how can you advise people right now in this scenario, in this pandemic reality we're in, to know when things have gone sideways? <clears throat> I'll do my best to answer that. I don't know if I actually know the answer myself yet. Um, and I'll just kind of share because I have had um, probably an average of two to three inquiries a day over the past like week or so, um, because I live in an area where um, folks really don't have a lot of access to home birth midwives, okay. um, but they know that I exist. And um, so I always, because I am understanding that um, unassisted birth is not necessarily for everybody. And I really, personally feel that this has to be an agreement between the birthing person and their baby really to kind of like safely go into this there has to be some kind of agreement that this is this is your path and you're going to walk this path together and you're going to communicate while you're walking on this path and i also am like really trying to be very conscious that not everybody gets to make that agreement right now. And I don't want to plant seeds of fear in people by immediately going to all the things that could happen. So I've been um, talking a lot more about encouraging people to check in with their babies and, and, and really sit with what does this what does this really feel like to you and encouraging them to trust that they do have intuition they do have a connection to this being and we've been led so far away from like what true mammalian birth is that we have been fooled into thinking that we need this technocratic model of care. And so really just kind of talking about for most birthing people and for most babies, less is more. The less we do and the less we interject our thought processes and our fears and our hands, um, the, the safer you are going to be. And then also just kind of saying, and if you can find a person to check in with, like mm -hmm. check in with them. If there's someone in your community, that's like an experienced doula, student midwife, how, you know, like kind of have these people in, in your, you know, your, your, your mind that you could potentially say, mm -hmm. Hey, I've been laboring for like three days, I, I think, what, what do you think about X, Y, and Z? Um, but really just, I guess, trying not to interject fear and trying to encourage them mm -hmm. to trust their own intuition. And I, I went on to have um, another pregnancy and I thought through that whole pregnancy that I was going to do this again. And when it came down to it, I really wanted my midwives there. I feel like babies call in the people that they need. And sometimes the only person they need is, is the parent that's birthing them. Some babies need all the people, you know? And so I yeah, feel like- I like that. That's a beautiful image. To say yeah. like, I, I don't know why, but these are the people that this baby is calling in and to trust that. Trust those that's beautiful. That for you. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Can I bring up another point, Please. Augustine? I'm sorry. Um, I know that everyone's 
practicing in different climates and you know I'm not even very this is a new kind of frontline idea for me but are doulas really attending unassisted births I don't yes 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 all over the country that feels like a very like interesting thing for me since I'm somebody who was at an unassisted birth that ended up transferring to a hospital and all the complications and heartache that that decision brought me I find that a quandary (laughs) Um, yeah me too just to be putting somebody in that situation of responsibility that's the most trained person in the room you know just legally all that kind of stuff I find that very interesting me too and I should say, I want to clarify too, I would never encourage, like I'm not encouraging doulas to be the attendants at unassisted births, but to have. But if that's have, your only resource, call someone. Or, yeah, yeah. A little yeah. Bit. I, I can see that completely. But I also know that people gray the line between midwife and doula all the time. And I want to make sure that midwives are midwives and doulas are doulas. <laughs> um, that feels very yeah. vulnerable to me. Um, yeah, well, since we might have a very broad audience, let's go ahead and just define it. Doulas are non-medical labor support. They are emotional, physical, uh, informational support only. Midwives are fully trained clinical providers that do everything except for pain medication and, and surgery <laughs> for mm-hmm. obstetrical care. So like, let's, be, let's define that so that that's clear. And yes, from that perspective, calling... Um, a doula to assist in a clinical situation is not a good idea. But if that's all you have in these crazy pandemic times and you need someone's help, then yes. The thing I would like to say as a resource is um, it seems to me that insurance companies have now green-lighted telemedicine which the, even though it's not necessarily has been a part of our, our repertoire, it is added now. And so I would just encourage all midwives to offer telemedicine appointments for anyone that's at home alone. Um, you can call your midwife and now with FaceTime like this, you can be like, is this too much blood? Is this baby having retractions? You can turn the camera on them and you can actually get a visual assessment that is protected by our new shifting healthcare Mm-hmm. And um, and be an assistant. Yeah, Priscilla, this is a great time for you to come in. Thank Thanks for thank for knowing. You. Priscilla's in Florida, and she um, has had two unassisted births, both with some complications. Tell us about how you walked through that. So, if I can just add to the conversation though, before I go to my history, yeah, sure. One sure. one very core desire that I had for both of my births was to take a hundred percent responsibility for pretty much every aspect of it and have my partner my husband be assisting me in that so that sounds like a control thing but it's like it's more so a responsibility thing and i was clear on when i was ready to welcome someone else in to the decision making of what was unfolding so a little bit about my history i had a very uncomplicated Sorry. Um, pregnancies. My labor with my first. My labor with my first was also very uncomplicated, super intense. But um, in the immediate postpartum, found myself bleeding excessively, and I had already in my mind kind of role played. Well, like, what would I do? How would I midwife myself through this? And um, with. Uh, those things in mind after, after a while, bleeding stopped, bleeding stopped. I did call on a friend, one of my best friends, and just, you know, kind of talked with her what was going on. And at that point, I welcomed in her responsibility into my decision-making process. And I was extremely clear on that. I, I listened to what she had to say. And from there, I made a plan with my husband and that if X, Y, and Z didn't change by X, Y, and Z time, we'd make a decision to change where we were. And thankfully in my situation, it worked out in my favor, but I was really clear on when those boundaries uh, shifted from everything's going a-okay to uh, we're going from normal to maybe this is a little bit more urgent. And so I think we're being, regardless of your experience, whether you're a midwife or not, whether you've seen birth or not, being very clear with yourself on like, I'm ready to give 
someone else's responsibility in helping me make decisions. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. <clears throat> well, so um, I, I, it feels to me like we're at this place ah. where we're kind of defining um, the defining the mentality necessary to make this decision. So I, I think, I, I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I'm going to say, um, regardless of pandemic scenarios, choosing to birth unassisted, choosing, not being forced to, because there's no other options, right? But actually choosing to birth unassisted requires a certain commitment, like what Priscilla just demonstrated, what we've heard several times of like, it's, it's, a, it's a real commitment to the process. Um, and so to commit to the process, you have to understand the process. Mm -hmm. So th then that takes a whole education piece, which takes research, which takes knowing, you know, how to get those. Re so, so it's actually, I think most folks who are going to choose unassisted birth basically know what they're choosing and they they have done enough research to know why they want this um and we're not going to unpack the why but that is true um and researching what complications are risky what what um thresholds for bleeding or for respirations or for whatever you decide to research come up for you um you set those thresholds for yourself um and I'm not sure we're going to ever solve this debate about, you know, hormonal process and instinctual birth. And, you know, I'm not sure we're ever going to solve that. Unassisted birth has been going on forever. It will continue to go on forever. Um, and so, you know, that, that kind of is what it is. If you have help, get help. If you feel like you need help, get help, you know, like that kind of thing. I, I think we've, we've sort of all said that. Um, what I'd love to do now with our remaining time is shift gears and, um, and really go into that um, dystopian reality that feels like a Hollywood movie of um, really social breakdown. Um, and um, I hope that it doesn't get to this. Uh, I have every reason to believe that um, flattening the curve by social isolation um, will spread out the cases so that we won't get to um, medical system overload. Um, but let's say that in certain areas that does happen. Um, uh, this, we did see this in Italy. I've been doing interviews with midwives around the globe experiencing the, the pandemic um, in their communities. And um, one experience was in Italy, they took over the labor and delivery wards for COVID wards and women would show up saying, I'm in labor. And they'd say, go home. We have no one to help you. Um, so I want to just explore that reality really quickly with all of you. Um, Again, this is not something we are recommending, and this is not something that we hope happens. Lord forbid, I hope it does not happen. But um, since we're on this topic, and there is the very real possibility that people will be faced with no other option than to do their own births, um, let's, let's just give some words of wisdom. Um, and Tanya, you're up on my screen, so I want to ask sure. you, what are, what are your words of wisdom? I think it, you know, one of the most important things to look at is the birthing person's emotional and psychological feelings going into a birth mm -hmm. and how important those are because we really have to, you know, like with my first unassisted, everything went great. I, you know, I knew I had my partner and everything. And then with the next, I did that birth alone and I didn't have a partner. And so that changed everything. And, you know, I have reason to believe that it really affected the course of my labor and stalling out. Um, I think for women that are being forced into this situation, maybe taking a ne an NRP class, a neonatal resuscitation class would be really helpful. There's no classes now. Everything's closed. <laughs> I'm telling you. Not even online. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, just yeah. like fully like resources that you have. What is, what is your advice for what, like, if it starts happening next week, what do people do? Go get some Chuck's pads. <laughs> <laughs> I have okay. some advice. I know what okay, I let's say. hear it. All right, okay. Carrie, tell us. Carrie, your okay. Um, 
don't push until your body is commands you to push. Mm-hmm. Great. Commands. It's like a vomit. Um, after yeah, I say it's throwing out, down, like throwing up. Yes. You know that feeling? It's like throwing down. Throwing down. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Um, uh, let's see. When your baby comes out, rub your baby and throw something on them, throw a t-shirt on them, throw a, a towel on them and start rubbing them and smooching them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll go in. When you see blood, that means your placenta is probably, when you feel cramping, start bearing down gently with it. Okay. Don't pull the cord. Yeah. Don't cut the cord. Good. Mm-hmm. Here's some shit I see on the fucking, you know, EMT is telling them to tie it off with something. What is I know, that? It's insane. You know what I mean? Like, don't do anything. It can to all stay right attached here. until the mm-hmm. whole thing falls off together a week later. Like, mm-hmm. you don't need to do anything. Yes. Don't ever do anything to it. Yep. Okay. If yep. somebody comes yep. and they're like, oh, honey, I got a cord clamp. Let me help you out. Yeah. There you, you go. But it. until yeah. then, you know, don't do anything with that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, most of it's going to come really instinctively to people. If you see mm-hmm. people on those car births and stuff, they're give birth. They, they, they do throw their baby right here. They start mm-hmm. rubbing their baby. You know, everybody yep. does. Yeah. And that's the most, that's the, and then also figure out how to check your fundus. After you have your baby, mm-hmm. your fundus will be probably at your umbilicus. Okay. Mm-hmm. It should feel the top like of your a, uterus. Mm-hmm. Yes. It should feel like a cantaloupe in your lower belly. Yeah. Start rubbing it. Rub it all the time. Rub it until you see that bleeding slow down. Great. Thank you. Yeah, Priscilla, I, go for it. If I can yeah. speak to the bleeding, I have lots of experience with that yeah, one. Yeah, you have. Yeah, um, I, I just so highly recommend to give birth on the floor and stay on the floor for a really, really long time. Do not attempt to get up. I mean, yeah. even if you're, if you're an ounce unsure, even though it might be completely within normal limit blood, there, just stay on the floor. I stayed on the yeah. floor for two to three hours after both of my births and it was totally yeah. fine. I nursed my baby as well as on the floor and continued to watch blood come out of me. It was less and less and less, but it was still a lot of blood. And despite mm-hmm. my uh, blood loss, I never had shock symptoms, never yeah. had ringing in the ears, never felt dizzy, never, n- none of that. And so right. I would suggest to be very aware of what shock symptoms might be. Mm-hmm. And for your partner to, if anyone's with you, for them to know what that might look like, the eyes rolling back in the head and all of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but what will save you from your head crashing down on the floor when you try to get up too quickly is mm-hmm. just stay on the floor for a really long time and let your body to adjust to your massive blood loss if that's what's going on. Yeah, I agree. I always say uh, recovering from childbirth is hard enough without a head injury. Mm-hmm. So let's not fall down mm-hmm. after. Mm-hmm. So I love that. Brilliant. Yeah. Can I, can I chime in for a second? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, so I am currently in an area that's very heavily hard hit. Um, yeah. I am in a small town in the mountains in Idaho. And if you look on all of the COVID maps where there's the highest um, density of cases, we, we are one of those places. And we only have 16,000 people in our valley. Um, based on the estimates that I've done, I think we've got at least 20% are infected. Um, I also do herbal medicine and I'm currently treating three to four new, um, people a day who are calling me with symptoms. So what has happened in my community is last Friday, um, labor and delivery shut down in our hospital entirely. Yeah. Our closest hospital is about 70 minutes away. Right. Um, after, after all of the women who are due to birth um, were notified that their hospital they were planning to birth in uh, was not going to be functioning at all, um, they announced that they were closing the entire hospital because at that point we had one ER physician left in the hospital. Everyone else was quarantine sick. So in my community right now, we have no labor and delivery place for women to go to. We have no birthing center. I am the only midwife. Um, Women are terrified. Women are in a state of shock. They have just been told there is no place for them to go. 
there is no provider to even receive them. They may have to drive 70 minutes to go to another hospital that may also close its labor and delivery doors next week. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, the message that I want to send to the women I'm talking to is that one, acknowledging the loss, like it's a, it's like a, what do they call it? A pre grief situation yeah. <laughs> with a, with a little shock thrown in, right? Yeah. Everyone is in this state of trauma. Um, and you know, that's not a place from which we want women making decisions about where and how to give birth whether it's you know going to a hospital or staying at home and i think that if we can direct them to places where they can really tap into their deepest part of themselves and do deep listening and and send them send them into nature send them to the river send them to the woods send them to quiet places where they can truly connect with their inner wisdom, listen to the messages that might be coming through. You know, women have so few resources right now, but they have nature, they have the wildness around them. I don't care if it's, you know, a little corner of your apartment where you have a, a plant growing, or, you know, if it's, if it's in the river behind your house, but I want to send women to these places and just really having them drop in, receive the messages and be still mm -hmm. and, and really unwind and do some down regulating from, um, you know, the big picture of everything else and being with the stillness and then seeing what, what comes from that. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Thank you, Erin. That's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think mm -hmm. one of the, the real beauties of this day and age is our super connectedness, but it's also mm -hmm. one of the real downsides. I mean, hearing the news rebroadcast every 30 minutes. I mean, I was just in a grocery mm -hmm. store and the loudspeaker is giving announcements about, you know, the pandemic in, in the growth. Like you can't barely get away from mm -hmm. it. So I love your mm -hmm. suggestion to mm -hmm. get yourself in nature. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. any other real sort of meat and potatoes or rice and tofu or you know whatever the, mm -hmm. like the the real info about what to do if you are forced to make this decision mm -hmm. um i'd like to say something um, yeah please i think it's incredibly helpful to know what a normal newborn transition looks like mm -hmm. as well great like thank you know exactly what a newborn looks like when they're born because most aren't born and mm -hmm. it can be scary <laughs> if they come yeah. out purple. And yeah. so knowing that if they're still connected to the cord, if everything is fine, mm -hmm. then it can take a minute for them to take a yeah. breath. It's totally normal. It's not something to freak out about. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, my, my biggest suggestion mm -hmm. for families that are really due in the next month that are facing this reality, not having time to shift and pivot their plans, mm -hmm. can't haven't, haven't located their local midwives, don't know what is going on, or like what Aaron was saying, like hospitals are closing. My biggest mm -hmm. advice is um, use the tools around you. So mm -hmm. you need a lot of absorbent things you need quiet and you can mm -hmm. watch all of this on YouTube. So almost everyone that does not have disruption of service and something like 77% of the globe's population has a smartphone. So um, mm -hmm. go ahead, watch videos of already of unassisted births or of home births attended by midwives. Look at how the normal mm -hmm. baby is. What on the ones that aren't edited, you can see that the placenta normally comes out in about 15 minutes. You know, mm -hmm. like these are things that you can you can start to just gather if you really are ignorant about the whole process. This is your first baby. Mm -hmm. You've always trusted professionals to take care of it. You've never had to have mm -hmm. any responsibility. I really recommend that you just put yourself on a little mini crash course of like what to expect. Mm -hmm. In terms of supplies, the most basic, basic things um, like what Carrie was sharing, um, your baby is already, you know, has everything they need if they just stay close on, on you. Mm -hmm. So your, your body will tell you when to push and it is like mm -hmm. throwing down, like when you throw up, it feels exactly the same, but the energy is mm -hmm. going down. So you're throwing down to get your baby out. And you basically just do that until your body pushes your baby out. You don't need mm -hmm. to be coached or counted at, or there's mm -hmm. no timing. Your body just knows mm -hmm. how to do it. When your mm -hmm. baby comes out, your baby wants to be near you. It is a biological imperative. It's kind of like a, 
a, a, a instinct to pick up your baby, good, do that. Nobody else needs to be touching your baby except for you. Mm -hmm. Your baby can be on your warmth, on your chest, on your belly. Um, you don't need to cut the cord. You don't need to pull on the cord. Um, like Carrie said, when you start to feel cramps again, you just um, go ahead and bear down like you were and your placenta will come out. Your baby will be at breast height. So even if you weren't planning to breastfeed, it's very important in this time to let your baby nuzzle at your breast so that it stops the bleeding because that biological process is designed to, to, to prevent hemorrhage. So your baby needs to stay on you and next to you and it doesn't necessarily have to latch onto your breast or your chest, but it needs to nuzzle mm -hmm. on your breast or your chest. Um, then you can just leave the whole thing together. There's After your baby is out and on you and your placenta is out and near you, there's nothing else needs to be done. It, you could wait minutes, hours, even days, and, and the whole thing will still be a self-contained safe process. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I just want people to, to realize that like we have been birthing for a millennia. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of the reason why it works so well is it's a very well-designed system that's been tested many, many times. Yeah. Um, and and the, sort of this is why unassisted birth became common or at least popular in the pre-pandemic time frame is because um, interventions interfere with it. But there are a few specific mm -hmm. complications that we should be aware of. Um, and so number one is a very long labor. Um, the average length of labor for a first-time mom is 27 hours. That's average. But the half of that is crampy, uncomfortable. It's not crazy pain. Mm -hmm. If you're in crazy pain for more than a day, there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. And you should try to get help. If you're actually in crazy pain that you can't cope with for even a few hours, there's probably mm -hmm. something wrong. And you can look for help. Can um, I tell you something from a, yeah, a person please. that had a uterine infection. I did not have yeah. a fever. I did not yeah. have any symptoms except for all of me was in pain. Not just yeah. my contractions, my thighs. Yes. When I went into the hospital, the first thing I said was, don't touch me. It, it, my thighs are burning. They hurt. Mm. So yeah. when you have an infection, it's painful. Not just your, your uterus is probably in more pain mm. than it would be. Um, but also all of you hurt, just like the flu, yeah. all of you hurts. That's great. Thanks for that. That's such that's great clarity. Case in normal labor. No, it's mm -hmm. not. I, I would, that's the other thing I would say is like normal labor is very copable. In fact, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, like it, you can get through it. You have the hormonal process to like rest and recover and then contract and rest and recover and contract. And you can mm -hmm. do that. And, and women all over the globe have done that very, very successfully. Yeah. So if, if it feels crazy, if it feels abnormal, it probably is. If you have pain that doesn't relate to just your uterus, it probably is something's going on. So pay mm -hmm. attention to that. Um, we do bleed upwards of a cup, um, or, sometimes two normally after we give birth. Um, that looks like a lot, probably more than you've ever seen. Um, but try to keep that measurement of like the cup out of your kitchen. Um, mm -hmm. You know, imagine fitting all the blood in that. If it fits in there, it's okay. Just mm -hmm. stay with your baby. Um, if you are still bleeding minutes after your placenta, rub your belly, like Carrie was saying. Um, make sure that your uterus contracts. And the best way to do that is actually to have your baby on you, nuzzling or latched onto your breast. Mm -hmm. Babies come out all kinds of colors. They come out slimy and gooey and sometimes purple, pink, blue, all kinds of colors. Um, mm -hmm. They should very rapidly become pink very rapidly within five minutes. Um, so that is the time to have your assistant help bring warm towels and to um, rub your baby and talk to your baby. Um, and if they're rubbing. crying their eyes out, they're fine. If they're fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If your baby's crying, they're fine. <laughs> it's a floppy baby who's not crying that needs attention. Mm -hmm. And the best mm -hmm. attention is on a warm mom being rubbed and talked to by mom and any other mm -hmm. support people. Um, so, so don't take your eyes off your baby until they're crying. But once they're crying, mm -hmm. you, you've made it. You're on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. that is basically birth. Um, mm -hmm. there's, we spend, all of us have spent years studying mm -hmm. all of the very, very bizarre, unlikely complications. Uh, but for, for most families, that's not what they need to think about. Now, I want to say a big caveat to this, a big, um, big asterisk around this conversation is if you have a pre-existing health condition, 
if mm -hmm. you have a major complication from a previous labor, if you have been told by your doctor that this, that you are very high risk, um, I would do everything you can to get to, to help get to a hospital that is taking people. Um, for those of you that are having your first baby, never been taken, never been diagnosed with a disease and aren't taking medication, you're basically low risk. Um, if you had normal births before, you're basically low risk. But for that very, very small percentage of the population that is on a lot of medications, that is high risk, um, you're the ones that need the care. So go get the care. Um, don't, don't try to birth unassisted. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I hope nobody has to try to birth unassisted. It's either something you want to do or you don't want to do. And if you don't want to, I hope you don't have to. But if you do, I hope these, these ideas make sense. Anyone else have anything else they want to weigh mm -hmm. in about suggestion? Yeah, Tanya, go for it. I was just going to suggest that you know, if a woman's got two to four weeks, she may want to get some iron building products like mm -hmm. Blood Builder, Floridex Plus Iron, Chlorophyll, something mm -hmm. that's going to build her blood counts so that mm -hmm. she hopefully doesn't bleed or is at less of a risk of bleeding. Great. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. I think there's lots of midwives doing telemedicine now. So use Google and find your local midwives and get in touch with them. Um, even if it's just so that you can reach them if you're in labor and you can ask questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to make a differentiation between like an unassisted birth, and I, I know we touched on it a little bit, but the differentiation between an unassisted birth and over preparing yourself and trying to be your own midwife. Yeah. Um, because you can't possibly get all of the knowledge. Um, for mm -hmm. some of us, it was a lifestyle before we chose an unassisted mm -hmm. birth. In this time and era, you're not at liberty to do as much research as some of us may have done leading up to our own unassisted birth. So it can give you a false mm -hmm. premise of what you should do to prepare. Yeah. Um, an unassisted birth should happen naturally. And if there are any complications, then that's the time to seek mm -hmm. someone with a little mm -hmm. bit more experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Brilliant. All righty. Well, it seems like we're, we're, we're slowing down here with our ideas. Um, I guess I want to end by saying um, making this choice because of fear is not, is not optimal. Mm -hmm. If you are forced into see, if you are forced into this, because there's literally no other options, um, you can't help but have some fear. But mm -hmm. right now, if your hospital system is functioning, if you have community midwives you can talk to, um, I, I wouldn't choose to birth unassisted because you're afraid of the hospital. That, that's, that's my takeaway. And that, that, yeah, I don't know if anyone has anything to add to, but fear-based decisions rarely serve us well. Mm -hmm. that's, sure. that's what I wanna say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add that I think um, surrender in these mm -hmm. uncertain, unplanned uh, circumstances yeah. is a huge uh, dynamic mm -hmm. um, to realize, like absolute surrender. Like this is not necessarily what you were choosing, but the sooner you surrender to it, the more you can shift the internal dialogue that it's a bad thing. Um, mm -hmm. It can still be such a beautiful, positive thing and all the physiological things that are most likely going to unfold when you surrender to that then you can actually like appreciate it more and like come to the other side of it instead of being fear-based that's beautiful thank you for that yeah yeah we're all mm -hmm. asked to breathe deep into our core and find our center and um adjust to these rapidly changing times mm -hmm. um we do that best by not being plugged into the social media. We do that best by putting our feet on the earth um, and really communing with ourselves and our babies. So um, yeah, take that time, uh, find some self-care routines, um, take mm -hmm. really good care of yourself, feed yourself well in these times. Um, mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> you know, rice and beans go a long way. So, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't have to be fancy, just feed yourself well. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, ask questions of, of the, 
experts in your community. Yeah. So this group of experts here is available. Um, certainly, we do have the ability to connect globally, so mm -hmm. don't hesitate to reach out to me. This video will be up on um, midwiferywisdom.com. It'll also be up on my YouTube channel, and I'm sure it'll be shared widely on social media. Thank you so much to my panel. I appreciate you all so, so much. You are gems in our culture, in our community. I'm so happy to be colleagues with you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.